Hi, my name is Robert Velasquez. I'm here with Watch With Us Channel uh, in New York City above Cellini. And we're here with Ed Malin of uh, Moser & Company. Moser. Pleasure. Uh, yes. Thanks for, for coming and talking to us. My pleasure. Uh, we're a relatively new channel, and, and a lot of people have asked about Moser. They've probably heard about it, but maybe you can talk about who Moser is, what the company is about, and how to, uh, you know you starting this company and running it. Starting is a big word, but yeah, Moser is a 191 years old yeah. brand, so I didn't really start it. But somebody else, Mr. Moser, started it in 1828. Is, uh, he was a family of watchmakers, um, you know, at the age of 21, he started his business, true entrepreneur, um, he developed an amazing brand that was one of the most successful in the 19th century, um, contributed to develop the entire region of Schaffhausen, brought, you know, a brand like IWC to Schaffhausen, he developed the, he industrialized the region, he bought the first hydromechanical dam on the river, a huge history, and this brand ran Probably until 1980. I mean, we have a beautiful museum in uh, in Schaffhausen with uh, the history of the brand that we run with the the foundation, the Moser Foundation. And there's really a gap of about 20 years where it's difficult to find uh, products made in Switzerland. There were some made in Russia because there was an entity in Russia at the same time. Um, but um, Swiss-made products, uh, not so many. I'm still looking to fill in that gap. 2005, it was officially really relaunched by a handful of uh, entrepreneurs, including the great-grandson of uh, Heinrich Moser. And 2012, my family uh, took it over, and I've been running it since then. Uh, why did we take over Moser? They had a little bit of um, financial, um, uh, some financial issues at that time, and uh, we felt we could maybe, you know, uh, bring our expertise, our um, experience as well and uh, yeah it's been uh, a lot of work on the product on the efficiency on the branding on the brand itself we fell in love with the amazing movements this beautiful history I talked about the fact that we fully integrated we do our hair springs we do the do all the parts in the movement we develop our own movements and um, I think that's quite unique for such a small company that's I mean, a, we're that's 65 a people today that's like such a gamble for an independent small watch brand and it's not really small you guys do a decent amount of watches. I think any entrepreneurial spirit, uh, entrepreneurial pro project is a little bit of a gamble. And, you know, you, you need to believe in it. I mean, I grew up in this industry. Uh, my father was in the watch industry. My grandfather, or my friends, my brother. I work with my brother. It's a family thing. It's passion. So I think you need to believe in what you do and, and have a vision like in any other entrepreneurial uh, adventure that people take. And your dad uh, was pretty famous in the watch industry, right? He used to work yes. for AP? Yeah, he's been running AP from eight, 1987, I think, until 2008. That's amazing. So you have the, the pedigree, it's in your blood to run this. How do you want to do uh, running this company? How would you run this company differently or similar to what your, your father ran AP? Well, it was, it was interesting because when we started, my father, you know, many, in many cases told me, you know, at AP we would do it this way and, you know, you should do it that, that way. And I think we all came to realize that you don't run a small company that makes 1,500 watches uh, in a very mar a market very dominated by big brands the same way you run one of those big brands. So uh, we learned a lot. Um, by you know probably doing mis mistakes and thinking that you can you can you know play the same game as the big brands, but when you're small, you're not the one creating the rules. You follow the rules. So we you know Very I true. think my father learned a lot from that as well. He's not in the operations, but he was the one behind you know kicking my butt and saying you need to do it this way or you need to do it that <laughs> way, and I'd be like I wish I could do it this way, but I'm not the one who has the the power in my hands to go to the handlers or to the media or to the customers and say you know you do it this way. I kind of you know we need to play a little bit more political there and, and find uh, the way to uh, to build relationships, to build trust, to um, to co convince people that your brand is is, is, is it, uh, its own uh, place, that you know, you're different, that um, they, tr they trust you. I mean, they are also taking a gamble. Here we are with uh, Cellini in, in New York. Well, a few years ago, they were saying, you know, it's a, it's a brand, you know, that needs excitement, that is a little bit dead. And I think we brought that, we sold them like, have a, have a vision of uh, what we want to do for, for Moser, and, and that's why we're very successful today. The growth of the brand over the last couple of years is amazing to see, and it's getting so much more traction, definitely because of some of the marketing things that have been happening. But for the people who've never uh, seen it or understand it, they may have seen it, you know, maybe some of the commercials may have seen it on social media, but what's the brand, uh, like the mission statement for the brand? What do you want people to know, especially stateside? 
I mean, if we, when we try to summarize Moser into in two words, we say it's very rare. And a lot of people say, oh, that because we don't do a lot of watches, that's true to some extent. But I think the, the very rare aspect is the independence. The fact that we are a family owned and run company, there are not many left out there. The fact that we integrated is also very rare. The fact that uh, you know we do everything, as I said before, under one roof, that's unique in the watch industry. There's a few bigger manufacturers that pretty much do the same as much as we do, but in many different sites and, and they're much bigger. Here, you come to visit us in our manufacturer in Schaffhausen, in about two to five, four hours, you could see really the, the entire process from uh, uh, developing, constructing, producing, and assembling a watch. And, and all that under one roof with 65 people is, is unique. And is I think that's something that for us makes it very rare. And also the, our approach to, um, to products and, and, and marketing. I mean, we, we believe in, in being different, in, in uh, creating trends rather than following trends. We are very, uh, I think we create very ingenious products in the sense of the complications. We don't try to show too much. On the contrary, we try to go back to the essence of the product. We, um, we try to combine tradition with sexiness. Um, we try to um, to bring this minimalism and also to 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 stay quite human in a, in a way. I think that's the strength of independent brands in general, not only Moser. That we, um, we we try to you know we have people behind being me, my family, but also even more our watchmakers, the people behind that. We we, we use humor, for example, as a <laughs> as a way of communicating, and which is quite uncommon in the watch industry. But I think humor is something very human, and and that brings or connect us with all the people who appreciate what we it, do. It's almost sort of un-Swiss of you to use this this, this comedic, uh, like this humor. I'm half marketing. Swiss, so maybe that's why. <laughs> it's no, but we have, a, we have a very, very young, I would say young, I mean, uh, you know, 25 to 40, 45. I'm actually one of the eldest now in the in the company. So a lot of, of people from very different backgrounds, um, some more British, some more French, uh, somebody from the Middle East, somebody from Asia. And I think that brings a lot of different cultures, but we have a common sense of humor. Um, and I think that's what contributed to creating this kind of um, language for the brand. Let's let's talk about the watches you just came out with today and what brings you here to the States, here yeah. at Cellini. What watches did you uh, bring and what New product you have? Well, we brought we brought quite a lot. I've I've taken four here as uh, samples to show a little bit what what we do and uh, explain a little bit what what is Moser. So maybe if I I mean I have here four collections and we have four collections. Actually, we have five <laughs> collections, but we have four here. Um, maybe the one I want to start with is the heritage. Why I start with that because it's it's a symbolic collection for us to express our heritage, our history, and it's inspired by products we have at our museum, at the Moser Foundation. Um, inspired specifically from watches from the beginning of the 20th century. Here, what's interesting is they have this case, you know, with the wire logs that is that is really traditional in a way. Finishing, it's in steel, but yet it has funky blue with three-dimensional nu uh, uh, numerals, uh, super luminova, which makes it very sexy at the same time. And that's what I love about this product is to express. I mean, in every product, I would like to find this tension between tradition and sexiness to, uh, to really express what Moser is. And it's, the interpretations can be very different. Here, there's a lot of tradition, but this touch of funky blue makes it very sexy. In, an o in another case, it might be very different. This is definitely very different than the other watches, just for the fact that it's it's more of like a, it's somewhat of like a pocket watch case. I feel like that's what it started with the Heritage Collection when you did something with enamel. Yeah. And then the wire lugs, which is very different than uh, some of the other traditional lugs. Yeah. Um, but then what I've noticed that's different than this and most of the other watches, I got a lot of questions on Facebook, Instagram, social media when I asked, what should I ask Ed? And a lot of people asked me, more than once, people were asked, are we going to have anything with markers eventually? Is there anything going to <laughs> Because I... get rid of everything, I, even the hands <laughs> now, you know? I love that you are doing the opposite and doing the minimalism and doing taking out the logo, taking out some of the markers. Um, but there's definitely obviously some sort of desire for some people that want um, you know, a minute scale or even a second track or for whatever reason. And maybe I can see that in the, in the, in the future. But I love that you did it in this watch and this has an actual minute it track. It makes sense here. And like numerals. For me, at this stage, it wouldn't make sense to do this as a concept. I mean, concept is about you know minimalism, the way that you, you, you design your hands and, and the case, etc. There's a lot of complexity in the case here, in the logs, in the hands. So it doesn't make sense in, the, in a model like this one to go full minimalism. Is this a three-part case? It's just a three-part case. Um, Whereas you have the center and the back is screwed in. True. And, and the top is probably screwed in. 
Yeah, an exhaust. So actually, the logs are added to. Uh, to oh, so you really? Could, you could consider it uh, four or five, sort of seven. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But uh, but yeah, I think it's um, it's a beautiful, very elegant product. With um, as we s always say, there's a three-dimensional element on the case here on the side, uh, the engraving that you could find also in the Pioneer collection. It's um, double hairspring tourbillon, uh, modular tourbillon, automatic, obviously all uh, in-house. The next one you have, someone actually asked me about Vanta Black and was curious about what led you guys to make Vanta Black and how difficult was that process to do it? <laughs> the, the idea came actually <laughs> from, a, from, um, from another brand. If you remember um, the brand that uh, my friend Pierre Jacques was running, it's called M it was called MCT. Yeah. They created a, a, a die where they had a few elements of, uh, of Vanta Black, which was pretty cool, very difficult to, to handle. Uh, for them who have very complicated uh, dials, it was difficult to put it everywhere, so they just had small elements. and they. And you know Moser is known for this minimalism. The problem with Vanta Black, Vanta means vertically aligned nanotube array. So it's really a matrix of small tubes vertically aligned, and it's a material where it was developed for the NASA for the telescopes to absorb all reflections in the telescopes. So this is not actually a color; it's a material, yeah. and this material absorbs 99.98 percent of the of the light. So it turns black because it absorbs the light, not because it's black uh, as oh. a color. And um, the whole idea for me is, you know, Moser is known for the Fumita, or has become more and more known for the Fumitas, and it was difficult to go back to a, to a normal black, black dye, so I said, how can we do something that is very different? And I like the idea of using something that is really high-tech uh, in a very traditional watch. And, um, and we started with the, with the Perpetual Moon last year, which was a huge, huge success for us with 50 pieces. And this year we're launching the, um, the Venture, so it's 39 millimeter um, concept, nothing on it, just this Vanta Black. Dials. We had to prepare. I mean, this is not a dial that we uh, produce ourselves. We have a company in uh, in, uh, in England doing it for us. Um, and to to, uh, to bring those dials to Switzerland, then we have special tools to assemble. Just setting the hands on it. If you touch the dial, you start breaking the the small uh, nano tubes. Oh, once it's tubes. once it's yeah. it's it's assembled and it's packed, there's no issue. It's highest quality. Uh, but you, when you set it up, you have to be extremely careful. So we had to learn how to do um, to do it. The watchmakers were getting crazy in the beginning, but they love it. I mean, it's challenging them. It's bringing them to the next level, and and I think that's why it's been such a such a success. We we cannot produce many of them. Uh, really, the dial is the bottleneck here. Uh, we have a capacity of um, I mean maybe 30 to 50 dials a year, so we didn't limit it. Um, the idea is just you know we'll we'll do whatever we can. Wow, 30 to 50. Uh, since we're talking about that, what's the production of of the uh, of the brand? You said about 1,500. Yeah, that's about that. This year, yeah. Um, and what's the price point? Uh, entry level is about eleven thousand Swiss francs. So for uh, independent brand, that's quite reasonable. I think that's there's not many reasonable. with a manufacturer movement. Yeah. There's not many, and and then you know, sky is the limit. We have the miniature Peter that we launched this year at three hundred and twenty, uh, ten pieces um, sold out. So it was. And you can success. only make so many of those, right? Yeah, we probably yeah, that's our capacity for the year. So we'll have something else next. How time. many miniature Peters uh, or things like that can you make? Ten. Ten, per right? Year. Yeah, pretty much. Amazing. Yeah. What's the 11,000 Swiss franc watch? That's the Pioneer in steel, 120 meter water resistant. I don't have it here. It's We're a launching sports watch. A, uh, it's kind of a sport watch. Very I love elegant. That. We have a black DLC. Unfortunately, I don't have it that we will be launching uh, this month. Uh, really? It's a pretty cool launch because we got, it's going to be a consumer generated launch. Really? It's be, uh, yeah. It's going to be a watch that's be traveling from wrist to wrist. Um, most of friends around the world that some we don't even know yet. Sign me up. Put me on this list. There's that no list. Amazing. It's just one. We, we choose the first person. <laughs> then he will choose the next one. Get we out of here. We cons it's all about trust. And it's part now. of the Moser, Moser <laughs> family. And it's the friends of our friends should be our friends. So we hope that it kind of creates this this community of people who appreciate what we do, who discover what, what we do. And the idea is, you know, I... You know, I'm I'm wearing it for uh, maybe a week or two, and then I take a few pictures. There's a website you can follow the the track of the of the watch, and then I hand it over to you as m my friend. I trust you. I I, um, I give it to you, and then you will hand it over to somebody else, and hopefully it goes around the world and meets new people. We might do some gatherings here and there. That's amazing. It's gonna be pretty cool. That's such yeah. a great concept. Yeah. So everybody's like, oh, it's gonna be stolen. Yeah, maybe, but I think if if fake. I trust you, and if yeah, I think it's we need to trust the. There's the watch family is definitely a good community, and they definitely care about their own. And you can see that in all the different watch groups around the world, and uh, the camaraderie that that's been happening. Um, it's changed, especially because of digital and social media. It's evolved what the watch community is in the last 
five to six years. Um, but talking about social media and digital, you have done some amazing viral campaigns, um, and people may have heard of Moser because of these campaigns. Wait a minute. Pass on my watch to my son, Tom. No, he's not getting my pioneer. Come on, guys. Such a cliche. Edouard? Tout va bien? And a lot of people, um, I think, want to talk about it and say, what's the difference? You know, what's why do it at all? And some people love it, and some people are like, I don't know, maybe it's yeah. questionable. What, do you, what, what are your thoughts? How did this happen? Why did you do well, it? Well, you know, at, well, first, because there were important subjects that we wanted to talk about. And our way to communicate when, you know, you have small budgets and everything is, um, yeah, to create, you know, things that are a little bit different, that provoke. Uh, I came to realize as I started running this uh, this company that you know you cannot please everyone, and especially as an independent brand, if you make something that everybody like, you're never going to sell a watch. You need something that where people love it and some people hate it. It creates this tension, it's, it creates this polarization, um, but it's important. It's important because it creates also uh, discussions, and there's no better way to anchor a brand in the head of people than having a discussion with some people saying, "I hate what they do. I think it's stupid, or there's no taste, or whatever." And other on the other side, some people will. Say, well, why? I love it. I understand why they did this. I mean, there, there's a message being connected watches, being Swiss made, being um, communication, being corporate social responsibility. Every time we do something, there's a strong message. Some people only see the very visual aspect of saying, oh, they did a cheese watch. <laughs> What's funny about it? And some people said, well, that's a very symbolic uh, way of expressing their opinion about the Swiss made. And that's the people we want to talk about. And you know, of course, there's going to be some people who say this is this is stupid. But there's, in any case, everything we do, there's going to be people like this. And it's very easy behind a computer to criticize, and it hurts sometimes. But you learn to uh, to live with it. And then you see that when you get attacked like this, you get other people that become even more and more uh, uh, connected to your brand, and that's very positive. That's and the first one we did and gave us a lot of confidence was the the, the Swiss Alp watch. And the Swiss Alp ah, yes. watch is something we launched. 2016 now and we're slowly coming to an end and uh, I like to say uh, at Moser we are like investment bankers people invest in our products invest in us and that's what I tell my team and it's our sp responsibility to protect the value of what they um, they invest in and we're happy to say that we, now we're coming to the end of the, the Swiss Alp watch movements that we have because the idea actually originally came from the fact that we had rectangular movements that when we bought the company we had on inventory that didn't sell because it just didn't that the design of the Henry Henry watch that we had at that time didn't appeal to too many people. And by creating this collection, the Swiss Alpwatch, we created a lot of visibility to the brand. Beautiful product, uh, strong message. And yeah, now in the next few months, we will slowly um, come to the end of those uh, those movements. So we, really? we have here this beautiful rectangular movement. Uh, we have some of the last editions that we, uh, we're launching here, the Cosmic Green. There's 20 of them in steel DLC. There's the same in funky blue and in old black. And uh, some people say, oh, you shouldn't stop. I think it's, it's, it was part of our history. It was a big milestone for the brand. And I hope in 20 years we look back at like one of those moments that helped us you know, turn around this, uh, this, this company and make us stronger and more confident. And, 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 and I hope the people who own it will, you know, will value it even more. And, and that's why at some point you need to say, well, that's, that's the end. And today for, for us to continue this collection, it would be a huge investment to create new movements. And no, I think it's better to say, well, that was a phase and now comes something else. And move on, that's amazing. If I can be honest with you, and I consider you a friend, um, but there's, in all honesty, I remember when this came out, I remember 2015, I remember I told you, I was like, what are you doing? Why would you do a watch that You're looks like the, the, one <laughs> like, the, like the iWatch, like the Apple, whatever. It was like it looked exactly like it, almost the same dimensions and everything. And I remember well, it was inspired re by connected watches, it was not by like you know, yeah, by smart watches. I remember thinking, um, man, you know, there's I love the brand and I saw the manufacturer back in 15 and I loved everything you guys did. And I, I really didn't like this watch and the concept. And I love that I was wrong about this watch so much because I don't want to be right about everything. And I'm so glad that you end up. I remember you telling me, oh no, we sold out all of the limited editions and then we made more, and then every year you made more, and that to me. Um, was actually pretty inspiring of what the potential Moser had and how they were going to go forward. Because regardless of my my years in this industry, like 14, 15 years, and what I my opinions were just opinions. And you're right that the best art is uh, sometimes it's it's a uh, it's uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's uh, uh, I 
lost to the provoking or provoking. <laughs> it's a. Uh, it's definitely uh, some people are gonna love, it, some people are gonna hate it. Yeah. And uh, polarizing. You know? Polarizing indeed. But uh, you cannot. I mean, again, if a lot of people said, "Oh, did you test it? Did you try? Did you ask your board and stuff like that?" No, because if I start doing that, um, then we dilute the entire message. A lot of people would have said, "No, never do it." I have lawyers on my board; they would have told me, no, "Forget it." Um, no, we do it, and then we we see. But sometimes, you know, you you pay for the consequences. Last year, we did the uh, Swiss Icon watch, which kind of backfired, and you learn from it. And then the next time, you do something else. You try to be smarter and 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 try to be more precise and better in communicating what what stands behind, uh, which was a mistake last year. But again, you cannot do everything right. But if you don't try and don't do anything, then you're gonna die. And exactly. I think that's the responsibility I have for my my brand. There's two responsibilities. I need we need to grow, we need to survive, and I need to protect it. Just really, to, for, you know, as, as the CEO of the company, there's two main responsibilities that I have. Of course, it's developing the company and building brand awareness, and that's where you take risks. But at the same time, you need to protect the brand. And I think last year we went, um, you know, when you're on the edge, sometimes you fall on the wrong side. But you learn from that. You do it differently the next time. You're trying to be more precise, clear message. And that's something we, we didn't do well last year. The funny thing is, I think that gave you more positive publicity, even though in theory it was a mistake. There was so much respect for for Moser as a brand because that you guys had the gumption and the dare I say the balls <laughs> to do that. I everyone I know, whether they knew the brand or not, yeah. whether they had any you know ideas or impression of of the other uh, concept watches, they were just like, wow, they well, from, actually did it. From a consumer standpoint, definitely, and people, a lot of people had dreamed, respect, had, had dream, uh, had the dream of creating that watch, and we did it, but. Um, but it was tough. I have Probably had ten, lost ten years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I have had a lot of questions. People, everyone wants to know where the watch is. <laughs> it's in my safe, but uh, okay, you know, it exists. You didn't like have existed. to yeah, throw it. We, we disassembled, disassembled it. Okay, yeah. which is everyone's but assuming it's like in a vat of lava. You throw it in space. Like what happened to this? Well, one? <laughs> a lot of people were speculating that it was just a computer generated. Um, Watch, but if you look at the at the, at the movie, and you can see all the scratches and all those things. So That's amazing. Let's go on to the next one. I know this is one of the newer models. At, at Moser, we like to um, to interpret um, um, complications, and here is a very modern complication, which is actually 200 years old. That's the Star Wheel system that was um, invented 200 years ago for clocks and AP. For me, it's like a milestone in for modern watchmaking. That's AP brought it back to life in the 70s, and then or a little bit later, and then um, and then Overk uh, really created like the new really modern watchmaking. And we, for me, it's important to to revisit any complications and try to make it the most way. And here we have those three satellites that are fixed. With uh, with a uh, which jump with the hour jumping from one to the other and the minutes indicator in the center that rotates and that's a pretty cool watch because it's the first time we do a watch without hands uh, and I think it was a, a great success. This is a white gold, hundred pieces limited edition. It's really cool. That's amazing. So you can read the time by the hours on each. Exactly. So for example, here it's four thirty, and if I rotate, um, you know, I go to. 450 it's also 500 and then you can see the the, the disc jumping oh. one after the other and that's the principle of those satellite systems I didn't realize that this is this there's like a direct there's a link from this star wheel and the first star wheel I think of is the one from AP yeah. with your dad what, what they put with the put the star wheel at the front where uh, because the, we have the same star wheels but they are the back and we don't show them <laughs> I love the case I'm a huge fan of the concave right here the, the between the lugs, it's one of the most one of my favorite forms. aesthetics of this case, and definitely sometimes I see that you have a curved sapphire case that fits the wrist better. And there's so many little details that you guys it's all about do the details, yeah. that most people don't talk about that we don't know. And I definitely want the people, especially you know the American market that might not be aware of Moser, um, about these little things that are I think very important. Um, so I definitely want to talk about that. But you guys make everything in house. I believe you have. Um, to have the watchmakers be responsible for their work, they have to start it. I think I read somewhere from start to finish. They're responsible. Is that how that works? And then everyone just does different watches. Or yeah, it's basically you know each, each we consider that each watchmaker has is in, is responsible for uh, for his watch. So it's important for us to be able to to track. Actually, that's wrong because we have 
we have watchmakers that are dedicated to the escapement. We have the modular escapement, and we can talk about that afterwards. But yes, one watchmaker is responsible for one watch, so he's gonna assemble from A to Z the entire movement. And then we have this plug and play system where you put the the, the, es the escapement in the end. But that's important to us because that's his responsibility. Uh, of course, they need to fo follow the same process to assemble the watches. Uh, we have like iPad system where they they know exactly what step to follow. Uh, perpetual calendar, for example, might might take up to one week to um, to assemble. It one? used to be two weeks, and now we've been very efficient, and that's what made also the success of Moser is creating watches that that make sense in uh, uh, in terms of you know pricing and everything. Just do one watch. It might take uh, one watch. It would make a week to, to, to put assemble. it together. Yeah, wow. it's just 326 parts, and that takes a lot of time. That takes a lot. Let's talk about the finishing, the quality. I mean, the the removal escapement. Remember when I saw the fact manufacturer in 2015? I was blown away because I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't know that was possible. Yeah. And that just makes so much. It makes it so much easier to service. It makes it easier for the future watchmakers. Um, it's an not easier to produce, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not well, easier to produce. It's once once you master your movements, which is the case now, it's very easy because we produce. All those escapements and each escapement fits any movement. So 90 95% of the, the escapements will go in any movements. Before, we needed maybe 10 escapements. When I took over the company, we needed 10 esca escapements and one would work for that movement. So it was a nightmare in terms of logistics. Today, because we have standardized, because we have processes, because we've, we, we have trained our watchmakers to all work the same way, uh, then it's, 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 a, it's a great system. And as you said, service. Um, this watch, the, the most complicated element to service is the escapement. What we can do today is ship a new new uh, clean escapement in all the different markets and when somebody needs it, a service then you just change it. It's very simple if the customer is fine with that and um, and that makes it much faster. That's brilliant. That's amazing. And the fact that you guys have so many different calibers and you come up with new calibers every maybe year. I think it's the same escapement. Yeah. yeah and, and, Pretty and much and all of them have the same escapement. Even, even the tourbillon. The tourbillon, the, like the one I'm wearing, has a modular escapement. So it's a modular tourbillon. And wow. That means a watchmaker that is not trained to service a tourbillon can service that tourbillon because he's just exchanging. That's amazing. And can you talk about the finishing or anything uh, that, that watchmakers do? The, um, the finishing is, you know, it's obviously very important. The, uh, the, the finishing, the, the Moser stripe is, one, for example, one uh, very important element for uh, for us. It's the large, thin uh, 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 stripes that we use, uh, a little bit like Cote de Genève, but that's the Moser style, and it's all the movements finished the same. The, the hand graving that we have with the whole mark that I'm wearing right now, all the watches since 1828 have that, and that's the way also to see whether it's a real or fake. There were copies already 200 years ago, 150 years ago, fake Moser. Wow. And that was very important for us to, um, to stick to, the, to those elements. So uh, most of those things are hand finished and, uh, and that's very important. That's the quality of the, of, the, of the watch. As you said, details, details, details. That's what makes um, a center second watch, um, you know, there are some at a few hundred US dollars and a few hundred thousand US dollars if you look at uh, Dufour or Utilainen or something like this. It's all about the details, and for us, you know, the the, the way we we finish the, the the case, the hands, the dial, the movement is extremely important. Um, really important about the secondary market of watches, and then how that e is so important to a lot of customers, especially in the United States. People constantly, unfortunately, are sometimes misguided, and sometimes they ask, you know, what's the watch, the resale value, what's going to be, what's going to be worth, and I definitely, and I see it, it. We're not as adventurous in this country where people are, are a lot more worried about. You know the, the retain value. Um, what do you say to that in terms of the quality, and then how can you change that or alter that? Because I see brands like Jorn and MBNF. Some people have started to start their own secondary market, controlling the market price by selling pre-owned watches. Is that yeah. something that you guys would do? That we're doing already. You're doing it right now. Yeah, we have a CPO uh, system on our website. We do it. Uh, only with uh, with watches that are discontinued, but I think it's important. I think, as I said earlier in the in the discussion, we are investment bankers. It's our responsibility to control the, the secondary market, to control the value in the future. I was talking about the Swiss Alp watch, which, because we don't have movements anymore, we'll, we'll, we'll stop. But another example is the Pioneer Blue Steel, which is our entry level, which is selling amazingly well. Well, in in in, in about two months, we'll be done with it. We'll finish. We'll do something else. Why? Because I believe it's important at some point to stop it so that we never see it in the secondary market. Or if we see it, at a good price. Uh, recently, I think Philips, Christie's had some Moser watches uh, for sale, three, four years old watches that are not available anymore because they were limited edition and stuff like that. The, the price is on par with retail or above. And I think there's not many independent brands who can, who can show that. I had people from other brands calling me and said, wow, you did amazingly well at, at Philips. And I was like, but I mean, it's, it's a constant work of saying, how do we control production? I, my rule when we create a collection is to say, 
the n minus 1. If we can sell n, then we need at least to create n minus 1 or minus 10 or minus 20 uh, products because that's the only way you, you control the, the value of your product. If you make n plus 1, that means you can sell n, but you produce more than that, then the value will, will not be uh, controlled. Because when the, the watch comes into an auction and there's still a new one on, on display somewhere around the world, well, why not buy this one at full price? The other one that has no guarantee, that is, has been worn in the past, of course they're going to get a hit. And that's why we see with many, many brands. And that's a problem for our industry because, you know, it being opportunistic and trying to sell and sell and sell, then you produce more and more and more. And retailers end up having those watches on displays. And the customers buy them or sometimes people discount them. And then you end up with watches that are taking a, a beating. It's definitely a balancing act. Uh, but how many doors do you have in, in the States? And if, is there anything that you want the American market to know? Before we we have about no, we have about 10, 10, um, 10 doors. I mean, it's, um, it's, you very, know, it's very explosive. It's very small. In, here in New yeah. York, we have one. I mean, we have a lot of people coming and say, oh, we'd like to open. No, I think it's, I'd rather have one customer, one partner that is happy. You know, doubling the number of doors, that doesn't mean you're going to double the number of sales. Exactly. What's going to happen is instead of having one happy retailer, you're going to have two upset retailers because they don't sell enough. So we believe in building relationship, long-term partnerships with the same partners who believe, who understand the brand. It takes so much time to train people to understand what is Moser, what makes Moser different. Um, and, and we'd rather control that in as much as possible. And, and yes, one day when we feel okay, we have reach the next level and there's enough demand, then maybe we open the next door and eventually our own boutiques, maybe. We'll see. Amazing. Well, I'm excited to see what happens and where it goes and the story continue because it's such an exciting brand and, and, and somebody I, that comes from like the school of Paddock and I appreciate that so much, like Corology, Paddock, Rolex, and all, all these other mainstream brands, independence has become such an important thing to me. And Moser is one of the most exciting independent brands, especially because they're at an accessible price point. And for the quality, it's absurd. So for me, it's always important to let people know how important one of these brands, which is definitely one of my favorites, and why people should buy it. So I'm really excited to see where this goes. But thank there's you so much of, for your time. There's a lot of excitement um, and the company because we have a lot of big projects coming also in terms of product development. For the really? Brand and, you know. uh, one last question Federico had asked me to ask. Um, will you be making a chronograph in the future anytime soon? Because yes. chronographs are my favorite. Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm very excited. Okay. I can't and, wait. And, and it's the, mo the craziest project we've done. Not alone. We work with, uh, with partners on that one. Oh, of course. It's not an easy. But it's got to be like the I hardest thing the to do. Cro best chrono you can find in the market today. Um, that has been developed, and it's a completely new case. Um, it's going to be very cool. Ooh, excited! But oh hopefully, I, hopefully next year we can show it to you. Oh, I'm so excited! Thank I mean, God. I'm great. I mean, it, just thinking about it, it makes me <laughs> have the goosebumps. And the team told me like, it's scary how excited you are about this project. <laughs> but you know, it's that's why we work in this in this business. Is for me product development, being able to to work with my team on those details, like the moment we're discussing the buckle, you know, fine adjustment, the, the bracelet, developing a metal bracelet because that's going to be part of that concept oh is God, the most really? difficult uh, thing we have ever done. And yeah, I'm very excited. I saw as the, you can tell. Oh <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I saw the, the bracelet you did on the Pioneer, and and just understanding when in, when independents do bracelets, it's the most difficult thing. And there's not enough extra. You can't charge ex, that much extra for the bracelet, and it's one of the most yeah. the toughest Pioneer things was, to engineer. Well, the Pioneer is is nothing compared to what's going what's going to happen there. I mean, the Pioneer was as I, th I think I mentioned, it was a bit of an accident on that one. Uh, <laughs> like the watch ending up on the on a tray, which was not supposed to be presented. It was a prototype and everything. It's going to be something very different. Great. But this this pioneer was an amazing success. I, I'm still amazed that a watch that we never officially launched kind of sold out like this. But you know, this, that's an industry I'm still learning. Pioneer is kind of one of my favorites. Yeah. So I'm excited. I, I can't wait. Thank you so much for giving us that no, sneak thank peek. You, Thanks for the time, and thank uh, you. we look forward to seeing what happens. Me too. Um, you could, I'm Spanish Rob on Instagram. This is Moser. There, uh, H Moser watches, right yeah. on Instagram. Yeah, um, Moser Watches. Moser Watches. Follow them on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Uh, they have a lot of different channels. Yeah. Um, my name is Robert Velasquez. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Hey, you're recording. Fantastic. Um, okay. Hi, my name is Robert Velasquez. I'm here for Watch With Us channel, and I'm here with Ed Moser, CEO of H. Moser and, and Company. You're here at Ed, Stateside. Ed, Ed Oh, <laughs> sorry, without what I say. Ed no. Moser, even know what I said. Ed Moser. Okay. Mm -hmm. All okay. right. Sorry, John Kelly, if that is whole thing. Uh